um, share my screen here. Uh, if you just bear with me for one moment. Um, all right. Well, thank you uh, for having me today. Um, see if I can get this move in. So I also uh, wish to acknowledge uh, the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek uh, Nation and Robinson Huron ter Treaty Territory and sacred lands uh, set aside for education um, uh, envisioned by Chief Shingwak uh, for the children and uh, for those yet uh, unborn. And I also want to point out uh, uh, that I actually used to, I grew up right around, you know, if you just go through the woods, just on the other side there, that's that's where I grew up. So um, so it's very nice to be home. Uh, it's really only been a short while. Um, but I'm hoping today that um, I can speak with you a little bit about research in the time of COVID-19. Um, I'm hoping that um, you know I can share with you uh, some of the lessons I've learned uh, and uh, you know some of the some of the great uh, things that I've experienced through this period of time. And I'm sure many of you will uh, find that your experiences uh, are echoed in, in mine. And, and that's part of why I wanted to share this. And, and hopefully we can uh, see a little bit of the neat science that's uh, being done in our community at the same time. So just before we go forward, uh, I do have a bit of a conflict of interest. I'm a part of a group that's uh, working to develop a uh, a COVID-19 related app called Community Pass that's uh, jaw, that's goal is to improve community safety. Uh, it's, um, uh, so that's really the only conflict of interest. So before I moved to the Sioux and sort of pretty much right when I moved here to Sioux St. Marie, um, I started working at the Sioux Area Hospital. Um, I had completed my training in infectious diseases um, at the University of Toronto. Prior to that, uh, I did my medical school at the University of Queensland in uh, Brisbane, Australia. And um, and when I moved back here to Sault Ste. Marie, I kind of thought of my sort of position as being part of Sioux Area Hospital and then, you know, the relationship with the Northern Ontario School of Medicine. And that was kind of where my, uh, my vision of, uh, you know, the um, academic uh, connections would be. Um, and actually, I'll be honest, I didn't ever really, you know, viewed my, uh, you know, next steps moving forward be in, in any, any way related to research per se. Uh, during my training, I was quite heavily involved in varying research projects and things, um, but I didn't really see that that was going to be my career path. And, and so I was focused on, uh, you know, clinical practice. But then um, what I didn't realize is there's all these very uh, accomplished and supportive um, organizations that actually lend themselves very well to research and uh, and education. And I didn't really quite appreciate the connections and what was available here in the Sioux. Um, we have the Sioux St. Marie Academic Medical Association that supports um, Sioux Area Hospital and Sioux St. Marie and Algoma clinicians. Um, it we, we also have the uh, Sioux St. Marie Innovation Center, which is quite supportive. Uh, there's Sioux College and the potential link there. And of course, there's Algoma University. Um, there are other organizations as well. And if, if I didn't know that these existed, and now I do, uh, I wouldn't realize how much opportunity and support there was um, for you know, the next steps. But then, uh, you know, uh, we have to remember that the past year has been quite uh, quite a bit different than usual years. Um, uh, we're all fairly familiar with this uh, little virus and and what it's done. Um, but I remember I was sitting on a beach uh, in Mexico um, in January uh, with my wife, and um, you know I'm usually pretty up to date with viruses uh, and pandemics and epidemics and outbreaks. Uh, but it's interesting because um, when you start following things in that space, you get bombarded with messages, this virus, that virus. And, and actually what happened was um, my wife said to me, hey, have you seen this virus uh, in China that's sort of hitting the news? And I remember vaguely seeing a, a, an email sent to me about it, but I didn't really think much of it. But when she told me, it, obviously it must be bigger than just what I'm reading in my email. So, uh, 
that was sort of what spurred my understanding. And little did I know that um, from that point forward, uh, our lives would change. Um, but what I didn't really appreciate was it was every aspect of our lives would change. It wasn't just my, uh, you know, that I would have to work and look into and research and, uh, you know, work on this virus, but I, all the other things that I was doing would be affected. Uh, just like everyone probably here on the call has had multiple aspects of their lives affected and research being one of them. So I think if there's lessons learned in research, uh, and I think most of you who do research uh, would agree that um, one of the biggest aspects of research that uh, you can almost say is uh, synonymous with research is failure. Uh, we all experience failures uh, as part of research, uh, but it's not a reason to stop. It's not a reason to quit. It's just the, the nature of research, uh, but it is the beauty of those failures that lead you to move forward and, and uh, pursue, you know, potentially bigger and brighter things. Um, so I wanted to start with sort of the negative of, of my experiences with research and COVID and, and one of the unexpected failures, if you will, uh, of the research that I've uh, been fortunate to be involved in. So we'll rewind a little bit to um, 2015, and I was training in infectious diseases, and I was fortunate that two of my mentors uh, asked me to jump in and uh, create a document or at least an article on allergy to penicillins and, and a review from, from uh, an infectious diseases perspective and how that um, uh, how, how important this acknowledging this piece is. So um, penicillin allergy, for those of you who are not aware, it, it's about 10% of the world's population or so uh, that report this. But in truth, it's probably only 1% of the population that actually have a true allergy to penicillin. Um, so we created this document because there was an emerging view that you know we needed to address this because not only do people that um, report that allergy get uh, different types of treatments and different, um, you know, things that might potentially uh, could lead to more antibiotic resistance in, in the grand scheme of things, and potentially even less effective treatment. So many groups started focusing on this. Um, and I was fortunate enough to uh, be mentored, and, and both of these folks uh, were involved in some pretty uh, important studies in the space, uh, looking at how, you know, the anyone who got a penicillin or sorry, who got, uh, was reported to have a penicillin allergy, uh, they would actually um, end up with worse outcome when they had an infection. And in fact, what they were able to show with further study was that if you skin tested someone, if you did a skin test to the penicillin allergy, you could actually remove that allergy if it was negative and those people would have improved outcomes. And that's where this study comes along. Uh, it's actually the, uh, the standardized penicillin uh, assessment and, and uh, sorry, allergy assessment and management. And it, it was a group of clinicians uh, across the province who wanted to find out if there's a way we could standardize the approach to this. And what we did was we, um, uh, we created an algorithm that uh, looked at uh, how you report, or sorry, how you take a history from a patient and how you can go from knowing the details of that allergy to the next step. So if they had some specific uh, reporting history of the allergy, you may go down one pathway where they might need penicillin, penicillin skin testing uh, or another pathway where you could actually clear them of their allergy altogether. And this, we hoped, could show that we could lead to reduced um, uh, complications because often antibiotics that you use instead of the penicillins can um, can lead to more side effects. But also we wanted to show that you potentially could have better outcomes for these folks because they'd be getting the ideal therapy. And we were all set to go. We had the REB in place. Our pharmacists uh, had done specialized training to do injection for penicillin testing. Uh, we had done lots of logistics work. Um, this took countless uh, years, I would say, to put together. And this message uh, came across our desk uh, shortly into the pandemic. Dear colleagues, as you are all well aware, the situation with COVID has evolved rapidly and all non-essential research will be put on hold. We have therefore made the difficult decision to put the spam 
quality improvement initiative and related evaluation on hold. We apologize that we're not able to continue in these circumstances and we'll be in touch as the situation evolves. Um, and with that, the study was uh, dead in the water. It was not proceeding and it was indefinitely canceled and we still haven't heard to this day uh, what's gonna happen moving forward. Unfortunately, this meant that uh, all of the good work and effort to try and improve um, history taking and management of patients with penicillin allergy was also put on hold. And so, uh, you know, this is a very uh, important in my, at least in my career, highlight of how these very important uh, research and quality improvement initiatives can be very quickly um, halted uh, for varying little things. Although I guess you could argue COVID's not a little thing, but um, that's, that's the story of, of that. So let's move on to more positive things. Um, so I wanted to talk a bit about uh, collaboration because collaboration to me is one of the most exciting and one of the, probably the most important and, um, you know, it, it's, it's one of my favorite parts about research. And I'm sure most people that do research here uh, would, ag would agree that, um, without collaboration, it's near impossible to be successful in research. As many of you are aware that uh, that hand hygiene um, or washing our hands or using hand sanitizer is a very important part of infection prevention and control. We're learning this firsthand in uh, the COVID-19 pandemic world, um, and we're, we're learning all these the important messaging of this, but this has gone since uh, the 1800s when uh, Dr. Semmelweis uh, noted in Austria that doctors who didn't wash their hands uh, were more likely to transmit um, infection to their patients. So we've known this for some time, and so we wanted, you know, th there are many, uh, uh, this is an important piece of healthcare uh, of ensuring that we take care of our patients and prevent infection. Now, part of um, hand hygiene is also making sure that people are doing it and making sure that if they do it adequately, we are preventing infections. But how does one measure hand hygiene um, compliance, if you will, whether or not people are actually washing their hands. Uh, you know, basically the standard approach is you stand outside uh, of an area and you watch, are people washing their hands when they're supposed to be? Now you can understand this is fairly a fairly crude method. And in fact, what ends up happening is you miss a lot of the potential opportunities. And uh, there is something called a Hawthorne effect, which uh, basically means that if someone is watching you wash your hands, you're more likely to wash your hands, uh, which makes sense, but it also over inflates hand hygiene compliance. And so uh, a lot of people are looking at how do we improve hand hygiene monitoring? So we actually get a real understanding of whether or not people are doing it. And then if we can better understand the barriers to people washing their hands, then we can ensure that we improve on people washing their hands and uh, hopefully improve on infection rates. So this is where collaboration comes in. So I was uh, fortunate to meet and work with a lot of folks in my training and uh, Dr. Jerome Lees uh, from Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center approached me and he said, you know, Lucas, we have this really neat um, quality improvement study that's happening uh, with a bunch of partners in, in Ontario. And we're wondering if potentially you could uh, join up but I said, well, you know, Jerome, I, I would love to, but as I, as I sort of said earlier in the presentation, I was focused on clinical practice and I didn't really, um, you know, have a ton of spare time because I was seeing lots of patients and mostly focusing on that. And so I said, uh, you know, I would love to let me learn a little more, but I'm not really sure I can do it. And then enter the Sault Ste. Marie Academic Medical Association, and in particular, Wendy Dota, who's a research coordinator for the group. And, um, and I said to Wendy, I said, Wendy, there's this really neat opportunity uh, for hand hygiene monitoring, and I'm just wondering if there's anything you can do. And within a, within a day, I'm pretty sure it was within a day, knowing Wendy, it was within a day. And she, she came back to me and she said, of course we can do this, no problem. We'll get grants sorted, we'll work it all out, we'll, we'll join up, no problem at all. And 
before I even had time to sort of correspond, she had already sorted everything out with the team down at Sunnybrook and we were well on our way. So it was this collaboration with SUAMA or the Sault Ste. Marie Academic Medical Association, collaboration with Wendy and collaboration with Sunnybrook that we were able to start this, uh, this project going. Uh, and through this collaboration, you can see all these hospital uh, names and university names, and uh, there's, there's certainly some missing, I can guarantee you. Uh, I put this slide together and hoped I covered everyone, but I don't think I did. We have regional hospitals. We have uh, large teaching academic center hospitals. Uh, there's University of Toronto, McMaster. I don't think I put in um, uh, Western, but there's physicians uh, from Western. These are infectious diseases gurus that I look up to that I'm linked in with and able to collaborate with on the hand hygiene impact uh, network. And through the collaboration with these gurus, these experts in their field and my colleagues, we were able to, with the help of Wendy, put together an awesome, uh, well, at least I felt it was awesome grant uh, to the Northern Ontario Academic Medicine Association uh, Clinical Innovations Fund. Uh, it was actually my first big grant, to be honest. And, uh, you know, with the work and help of all these folks, you know, we got it. We got this grant. It was actually phenomenal. And this was, this was in uh, late 2018, early 2019 that we were able to uh, do this work and move forward. So part of the research uh, is trying to figure out if electronic hand hygiene monitoring can improve your outcomes for infection prevention and control. And in order to do this, we had to know how many times are you supposed to wash your hands? And part of that you know, given the way the system is set up is you actually had to watch people wash their hands. It wasn't about you know, judging how well they're doing it or, you know, actually auditing whether or not they were doing it or not. It's actually just seeing how many opportunities in the day is there to wash your hands. Uh, but this was a huge undertaking. You could imagine in order to watch how many times over a day for the 24 hours that are in a day, you'd need a lot of man hours. In fact, we need hundreds of hours locally and thousands of hours across the province to figure this out. I wouldn't have been able to do it alone, especially given my clinical responsibilities. And with the help of Wendy and Suama, and even you know, nursing students from Sioux College and volunteers, we were actually able to put together a team of volunteers that could actually sit and watch how many times people were, should wash their hands. And we were actually came up with the number of hours we needed to join the study and it was quite incredible we call these the hand hygiene opportunities portion of this hand hygiene impact study and we were actually able to do it because of collaboration with uh, numerous folks and with time we were able to implement this electronic hand hygiene monitoring and we were able to see data in real time of whether or not folks were washing their hands so to put it in comparison we were able to see thousands of data points on people washing or not washing their hands in comparison to doing those regular audits that I mentioned before are fraught with problems such as the Hawthorne effect, we are now able to see thousands of data points versus, you know, in the range of tens or twenties, or if you're lucky, you know, 50 some audits, these are thousands. And what we saw was our, uh, you know, our hand hygiene could have done better. Uh, and, you know, this was ubiquitous across the province. We saw this throughout, uh, throughout the province that people's hand hygiene rates probably weren't as good as they should be. But what we saw with time was they got better. And why? Because we were able to give real time feedback to folks about how they were doing. And with that information, you could try varying quality improvement strategies to improve the hand hygiene compliance and so this study not only helped local understanding of infection control and prevention measures, it also is a pretty robust study that actually could help us measure um, you know, some of these impacts on infection spread and disease outcomes. And then struck the pandemic. So this is the theme of the day. Uh, and you can see the empty shelves and that's where hand sanitizer previously sat. And you can see these guys in the bottom corner trying to produce hand sanitizer. I believe that's in a, um, in a uh, beer producing facility, if I'm not mistaken. Um, 
And so everyone has band together to try and produce hand sanitizer. But the problem is for studies like this that use sort of more sophisticated methods of measuring, you need a specific type of hand sanitizer, which we could not get. And so this meant that uh, varying places in, in ICUs across the province, they weren't getting the technical product they needed so that the machines would work properly. And so unfortunately, this led to uh, a bit of a problem with the study because I had ICU managers and uh, intensivists and folks involved in the study locally coming and saying, do we trust the data? And although we had a great collaborative approach uh, and we were working with them to try and improve things, uh, with this study, they asked the question and they kept asking the question. And this was not just here, it was across the province. And unfortunately, we've had to put the study on hold, hopefully only for a short term. But it does show you that, you know, even with the best collaboration, uh, you still, uh, you know, can get fraught with some complications and, and problems. But that being said, through collaboration, we hope to get better and we hope to be able to resume this, this study. Mentorship. Uh, for those of you who are involved in research, mentorship is probably one of the most in, uh, important pieces to try and move the or push the needle forward uh, as a collective community. Uh, and um, you know, some people have time for it. Some people really enjoy doing it. But I argue it is one of the most fulfilling pieces of of uh, research. So. I saw this cartoon. It says, Tom, mentoring is more about more about more than sorry, encouraging people to be just like you. And uh, it's, it's funny because I think, you know, you really have to think of all the important pieces of how mentoring can can help push the needle or move the needle forward. So as part of my role at Suria Hospital and then uh, joining up with NOSM uh, as an assistant professor was that I had students coming in rotating with me for um, electives or you know, experiences to learn about infectious diseases. But then I started to get requests about research and how could they join me and they can start doing their own research or at least you know, I don't know that they thought of it as doing their own research, but when they first came in, they said, how, do, how can I get involved in some research? But with the help of SUAMA and the Innovation Center, uh, we are actually able to support um, research happening uh, by uh, residents and medical students uh, and trainees, and even folks who aren't in medical school, some, some preclinical folks, so that they can actually get experience in research. And part of the important thing of mentorship, as many of you are aware, is it's not just about, you know, as I showed in the cartoon, uh, getting them to jump on your projects and getting them to, um, you know, do all the research you're doing. It's about opening their mind and providing them with the opportunity to, uh, to do research uh, of their own accord. And uh, I had one student who did a lot of work with me um, and uh, we were able to come up with a project that looked at wound care and dietitian uh, or, or dietetics and how they are complementary and important, how they flow together. And we were able to look at what's happening locally at the Suaria Hospital. And he was quite passionate about this. And although, uh, you know, dietetics is not my area of expertise. And I had only just started looking into wound care from a professional point of view since I've moved here. I thought, you know what? He's very excited and motivated. And so why not support this? And so together we were able to pursue research in this space. And although COVID left us with a lot of tricky things um, and uh, he actually had to turn down a... Um, acceptance for an abstract of our research at a conference because of the virtual nature of the of the conferences he was actually able to attend a few including uh, the Northern Health Research Conference and that was one of the um, you know highlights for me when I got when I got to see this uh, that he was able to um, uh, publish this I was I was actually pretty uh, proud and, and excited for him uh, that, that together we were able to, but mostly he was able to accomplish this because he put a lot of time and effort uh, into this study. And so mentorship is, is one of the key pieces. Uh, and 
even during a pandemic, even when um, times are, are tough and tricky, um, it's important to do this. And I've been fortunate that all the folks that I have uh, supported through this time uh, have actually supported me. And they've done some amazing work and research and are continuing to do so uh, even during this tough time. Unexpected opportunity. So we all know that we want a treatment for COVID-19. Um, when the pandemic first hit, we didn't quite know what to make of this virus. We had a sense that it maybe was similar to SARS, uh, maybe similar to something called MERS-CoV, um, maybe similar to other coronaviruses. We didn't quite know. But what we didn't know was how do we treat it? We, we didn't have any good drugs directed for these things in the first place. So most of us infectious disease doctors started thinking, hey, why don't we figure something that will work? And lo and behold, there wasn't really anything. And time and time passed and everything was tried. I'm just throwing you, showing you this picture of something called remdesivir, which is an antiviral drug, which I'm sure you've heard of, uh, which may have some benefit in certain circumstances in COVID. But again, it was a repurposed drug uh, for, uh, for an infection. And so, you know, in, in medicine, you start thinking, what treatments uh, can, can work, can be effective? And like I said, you know, in my field of infectious diseases, I'm thinking of medications. I'm thinking of antibiotics or antimicrobials because that's, you know, commonly what I use. But then most of us started thinking outside the box and we recognized that the disease process is not uh, unsimilar to other respiratory diseases that can cause severe lung illness. And I was listening one day to a podcast uh, from a friend of mine uh, from Toronto. His name is uh, Mike Frelick. Uh, uh, Dr. Frelick comes up and locums up here, and we actually train together in internal medicine. Uh, we are actually in the same sort of cohort, uh, and we're, we're good friends. And I, I heard him speaking about prone positioning for patients with hypoxic respiratory failure related to COVID. So prone positioning, if you're not aware, is basically where you lie on your stomach uh, to try and help with, um, with basically recruiting parts of your lungs you wouldn't normally uh, breathe with if you're lying on your back. And it was felt that for people who were awake and on the wards and not in the intensive care unit, this may help prevent them from ending up there. But also around the same time, I was quite interested in getting our center, the Suaria Hospital, involved in research in the space of treatments for COVID-19, uh, partly because I thought it was important to contribute to science, but also partly because we do know that people will prescribe whatever is available to them. And, and that is because, you know, a lot of prescribing in medicine, especially in infectious diseases, is emotional. And if you're facing patients with COVID-19 and you have nothing in your armamentary to use, you're going to start prescribing whatever may have uh, some resemblance of data or support, but you're not at the same time contributing to science. And so I, I said, you know what, I'm going to call Mike. I'm going to ask him what we should do. And I said, Can, should we join this randomized trial to do with remdesivir or uh, to do with all the other uh, treatments? It's something called CATCO in Canada, which is a big, uh, complex um, study. And he said, well, how many COVID patients are you guys seeing up there? I said, you know what? Our community is doing very well. We're, we haven't seen many COVID patients through our community at all. He said, well, it's actually a lot of work, but why don't you do this? Why don't you join COVID prone. And so, uh, you know, it was an unexpected opportunity that he said, you know, you could just join in, no problem. We'll go through all the efforts. We'll, we'll sort it all out and we'll get you guys sorted. Um, and what COVID prone is, it's a pretty neat study. It's a randomized controlled trial that looks at whether or not you do or do not get turned on your stomach. Well, you, in fact, you actually turn yourself on your stomach, uh, whether or not that can actually improve your outcomes with the infection. And so, uh, and so I'm fortunate to say that because of his help and support, uh, we've been able to join that study and we're now uh, actively recruiting. If it were, come to, were to come to someone be admitted to the hospital, we'd be able to, uh, to offer that, uh, that study. Perseverance. So no research, uh, you know, uh, experienced doc should should not uh, shouldn't uh, 
include perseverance because you know if you if you aren't perseverant, um, you you will not um, fully appreciate uh, the you know the fruits of your labor. And uh, one of the things we were involved in during the pandemic was looking at our healthcare workers and how do we ensure that they're safe and how do we monitor them and and make sure that you know what we're saying is accurate. You know we're, we believe that. The masks and the shields work. We know that um, there's experience that they should work, but how do we monitor? How do we how do we do how do we understand that? And can can that be used to improve the science um, nationally and, and globally? And um, we were lucky uh, because. Um, through some connections uh, with uh, some folks th that I know in Southern Ontario and through some granting agencies, uh, there, were, there was a lot of support to do research in terms of immunity to COVID-19. And, um, and antibodies found in patients, or in this case, healthcare workers' bloodstream uh, to the COVID-19 virus would suggest that you've been exposed to the virus before and you may or may not have immunity to that virus. But the important point is if we can understand whether or not we're doing the right thing uh, from a prevention point of view, i.e. if our healthcare workers aren't really getting infected with COVID all that much, then that would be helpful and supportive. But if we were missing things, then that would also be important for us to know. But a study such as this, a laboratory study during COVID uh, focused on, um, you know, looking at our own healthcare workers involved a lot of support. In particular, we needed to get occupational health on board, who then said, you know what, it's COVID related, we actually have to get incident command on board. And for those of you who don't know the incident command uh, center, it's, it's, actually specifically for a emergency situation, what many organizations do is they create a structure that's almost military-like where you have a commander who is the person who makes the final decision and has to be ready to make quick decisions. And then you have sort of a, su a supportive team that's very small surrounding them. Uh, and so at the Surya Hospital, we have such structure and so do varying organizations around the community. And it allows us to be agile in, in the time of a pandemic. And so we had to reach out to them for this study. Uh, we had to get the logistics sorted. So with Auk Health, we had to get the lab on board. We had to get uh, you know, human resources on board. We had to figure out where would we house these samples? Did we need a different uh, freezer? Uh, how would we ship the samples? All those pieces needed to be sorted. We needed to get research and ethics on board. I mean, this is huge. We're, we're dealing with uh, the implications of knowing whether or not you've been exposed to a virus. So we had to make sure that, uh, you know, we had our, all our ducks in a row for REB and we had, to, we had to make sure all that was in place. And then we had to make sure that our communication out to those potential, um, you know, study participants were accurate and, uh, and safe. And however, that we were still able to recruit uh, individuals in a timely fashion. Uh, as you are all fairly well aware, we are proceeding in the next short while with vaccinating our healthcare workers. And so it was important that we pushed forward with this study because we needed to uh, get this information preferably before the vaccine went out, but certainly we can still uh, use the information after vaccine happens. And I'm happy to tell you that after the perseverance and work, and, and I, I can't say anything but thank you to Wendy Dota again from SUAMA and the amazing folks in our lab and occupational health who basically moved hell and high water uh, in order to get us um, to get us in and started. So we are, we are actively enrolling and we have current participants here at Suaria Hospital, uh, which is a, a multi-center study across the province. Innovation. So it's important to be innovative, I feel, in the research world, and I'm sure most of you agree. And that's why when someone approached me with this very interesting initiative for research, I wanted to jump on it. But it, it was the time of COVID, as you're all aware, and uh, doing things during COVID become tricky. Uh, however, um, innovation is important. And part of this study, it's called the General Medicine uh, Improvement Network, 
And the important thing about it is it's actually using technology to improve how we understand the patients we're caring about, the diseases we're, they're, that, uh, that those patients have. And also, uh, we understand the prescribers and the physicians that are involved. And if we could, uh, could do that in, an, in a more automated way, this could actually help us predict things moving forward and be able to function as a hospital and as a program from medicine from a medicine perspective better and so when i was approached with this i was very excited and uh, and so we were able to join in and we're we're now uh, a part of the team we haven't fully um you know, uh, seen the fruits of our uh, label labor yet uh, this will take many many months to do but uh, but this is a very large uh, study with billions of data points um, that uh, that will be involving multiple hospitals across the province. And tomorrow, um, you know, where where do we go from here? Uh, there's so many opportunities and, and so many things uh, that that could that could come about and I'm, I'm never closing my eyes to any opportunity. Uh, yes, my bandwidth is more narrow than it used to be. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not able to accept as many projects as I normally like to, but you know, if I hear of an interesting project that I think we can, we can handle, I'm certainly the first to jump on board. And, you know, even just the other day, a friend of mine asked me about a new testing strategy for COVID-19 and I said, let's look into it. This is, this is neat stuff. Let's, let's move forward. Um, and so always thinking to the future, what you're able to do, what you're able to accomplish, even during a pandemic. And with that, I, I guess I'll open it up to if any, anyone has any uh, specific questions or anything. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, that, that was absolutely amazing. Uh, very informative. I surely have a lot of questions for you, but I just want to pass it off to uh, Dr. Rogers for right now, who has a, a couple words that uh, she wants to say. Yeah, and I won't interrupt the flow too much. Thanks, Narosha, and uh, thank you to uh, Dr. Castellani. I um, <clears throat> was late to the party. I apologize for that, uh, because originally I was going to welcome you and uh, help you know, you know help you kick off Research Week at Elgin University. So I will just say really quickly, we're so delighted that you could be here, and, and I did get to hear everything I think but your first thirty seconds. So um, thanks for for being here with us, and I know that. Um, you know, a lot of people are very interested in the work you're doing and, and also in, in the concept of conducting research during a pandemic. We know from the Ontario Council of University Research that uh, a number of particularly early career researchers are really um, finding significant impacts from COVID on the work that they're able to do and the collaborations they're able to uh, conduct. So I, I appreciate your perspective on this on behalf of all of us. So I'm going to say welcome and um, back to uh, Narosha for the Q&A and um, uh, just uh, again, sorry for being late and uh, really happy to be here. Thanks. Yes, yeah, so everybody who is here, I'd like you to, uh, if you have any questions or, or, or comments, uh, please uh, leave them in the chat and I will try to relay them and uh, Dr. Castellini can hopefully answer them. But uh, as we give our audience a couple minutes to ask questions, maybe I can ask you a couple. Um, one of the questions I had related uh, was to the, the prone position study that you had there. Um, is there any impact on age or weight in, in your studies? That's something that you're that you're looking into. I think that's quite interesting that just being on a specific position um, can can drive a certain prognosis. So, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, there is, uh, you know, certainly some issues in terms of mobility being uh, a big uh, piece of the COVID prone study. So the, you know, because it's meant to be a simple study that's, you know, easy to uh, to do, we do try, We there are some restrictions in terms of weight and mobility uh, because, you know, although we want to encourage as many participants so we can get as much data, uh, it's sometimes tricky uh, when, you know, if someone has a an elevated BMI to be turning over frequently, or, you know, I think you mentioned age. I mean, certainly they're looking at that, you know, if age is a, is a player uh, in this, but um, you know, the, the main issue is functionality. And, and if you can't turn yourself over on your own, uh, it, it also can become problematic for someone with COVID-19 if they're trying to maneuver and things.
things and they, and they can't be supported by their team. You know, part of what was, I think, encouraging and what allowed this study to move forward by my colleagues was that uh, it didn't need a lot of manpower. And so uh, part of infection prevention and control is limiting traffic in and out of rooms. And if you could do that uh, and still have this intervention happen, I think it, uh, I think that's part of why that they, they proceeded this way. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, that'd be really good to see what the, the total outcome of that, of that study is. Um, and yeah, so I'm, I'm not seeing any questions here. So I'll just ask you just a couple um, uh, here. Oh, we have here one from uh, Dr. Bloomfield. Uh, what is your advice or go-to message to young scientists or students who begin to feel overwhelmed with the pressures of lit review or academic requirements, uh, school, work, life balances, and potential hurdles that might arise? Yeah, it's a very, very good question. I wish I had the answer to that. And I think that, uh, I think that speaks to it. Uh, I think the important message is you won't know everything. Uh, in fact, I've spent many a nights feeling probably the same way you're feeling, uh, you know, as a young researcher. Uh, and most of us probably have gone through the same, the same existential crisis from time to time. Uh, but I think what was actually, uh, you know, tipped the scales in my favor from, I kind of went from being very research focused in training and then moving here to Sault Ste. Marie and then being more clinical focused. But what tipped the balance was understanding and appreciating that you can only do so much. And if you, if you understand that and appreciate that, then you can get a lot more accomplished because you're not, you don't always have that barrier in front of you. And then the other piece is asking for help, being okay with asking for help and saying, I don't know. Because if you don't know something, someone probably does and probably could tell you that answer quickly. You don't have to spend hours and hours looking for the right journal article or the right supportive literature because someone else has already done that work for you. So it's important to collaborate. It's important to get a team on your side. And that helps you to do all of those things like, you know, ensure you have the right academic requirements, making sure you have, you know, work school life balance uh, you know if you can get you know get away from the I think it's the ego piece we all want to be able to do it ourselves uh, if you can get away from that you can move you can push the needle forward so much faster and so much so much more efficiently it, you know without the folks that I mentioned today in my chat there I think that's why I put a lot of emphasis on all these groups and all these individuals it's because without them there is absolutely no way I would be able to be involved in all of these studies not to mention a supportive wife. I, I, I should also say that I have a very supportive family and my wife is, is, a, is an angel. Definitely takes a, takes a team to personal and, and at work to get research, to research going. Awesome. I mean, it's, it's also uh, very comforting to see that, you know, being in Northern Ontario, you're not really limited in the research that you can do. You can still connect at a provincial and national level with all the various studies that you're doing. Um, so that, that that's very comforting to see that there's really not that much limitation. But do you do you think there's any sort of limitation in the health sciences um, in terms of resources or facilities, uh, te uh, technology that might prevent or kind of slow down research, uh, health science research in the, in the North? So I, I think, I think there's pros and cons, right? I think you'll find some things that are a disadvantage up here and some that are advantage or advantageous. I mean, uh, certainly you're right. We don't have the big academic medical centers. So we don't have the uh, you know number of folks that are focused in one specific area. And when you have many people doing, one, doing work in one area, that actually is gonna push things forward. Uh, and certainly this, you know, that's in laboratory sciences and clinical sciences and all sorts of, uh, um, areas of research. That all said, um, you know, if you're also the only one doing something, that actually also opens up a lot of doors. And I would say that I'm I'm really fortunate that I came at the right time um, because there are a lot of people that have the same idea that why can't we do it here? What what's stopping us? I mean, we're we're connected more than we've ever been connected. And so, yeah, so what? They have 10 people doing the same thing in Toronto. We have no one doing it here. We have so much, so much we can learn from here. 
but we could still link with them because it's easy to connect. So, I mean, there, there, are, there are pros and cons or advantages and disadvantages, but I'd say overall, I think it's more advantageous. There's a wealth of things we don't know. And in particular with the populations we're faced with here in the North uh, that do need study because they've been neglected for so long that I would just encourage anyone who's looking into it, there is an avenue for you to do so. Absolutely well said. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, we do have a question here from Sawith. Uh, in the study that looked at diet and wound healing, did it include patients with comorbidities like diabetes? Yeah, for that study, it had all comers in the hospital uh, with um, with wounds. It was basically anyone who came in with a wound we were able to look at and see uh, whether or not uh, diet uh, was uh, strategic or I should say systematically looked at uh, how many people had diet con consults and, um, and you know, a, a good proportion of them had diabetes. It's a very common complication of diabetes. Um, an interesting tidbit that I never really fo pointed to, but the what I found, so there's another pearl of studies. Um, what we learned was actually a majority of those patients that came in and that had wounds actually needed antibiotics. Uh, that, you know, majority of wounds that come into hospital aren't infected. I can tell you that just clinically. Uh, but we learned from the study that actually most people were given antibiotics. So it, it's actually a neat pearl of that study. We were able to see, learn something totally that we never even expected to learn out of that. And it's an opportunity to try and limit antibiotic prescribing. And, and that's uh, uh, through the work of this, uh, of the student, we were, we're probably going to push the needle a little bit further from a, you know, an intervention or quality improvement point of view from antibiotic stewardship or trying to improve Prove how people prescribe, trying to limit antibiotic resistance in the future. Uh, hi, I'm going to jump in because uh, I'm going to help uh, monitor all of this. There are a couple of questions in the Q and A, um, and actually two of them are from from Elvis. So I'll maybe pop them together if that's okay with you. Um, one is, as an infectious disease specialist at Suaria Hospital, what future strategic plans in the context of medical procedures do you have in place or in mind to get Sault Ste. Marie ready to combat another pandemic if it's to happen again? Yes. <laughs> wow. Complicated question. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know what hat to wear, I think. Um, so uh, I guess as an infectious disease specialist at Suaria Hospital and infection control being my focus, I, I think one of the big concerns or burdens is another pandemic. I think that I think we're all concerned about that now. But the other the pandemic or the the, the infectious disease problem that everyone's been talking about, at least in my space, uh, has been uh, antibiotic uh, resistance. And that is a big problem globally. That's a, the, the, we talk about something called one health. And, um, and that's that means, you know, environment, uh, animal health, human health, climate change, it, it all relates to each other. And what we're seeing more and more with time is there is a connection and we're going to be faced with more and more problems in this space, more infections that are happening in places we never expected them to happen. We're seeing, we're seeing viruses and bacteria up here. We never really were we're seeing before because of climate change. I mean, the, these all these things are happening uh, in front of us. So, so I've been, uh, you know, thinking in my head about how to address these. I haven't actually specifically done anything in that space. From an antibiotic uh, resistance point of view at the hospital, we have a, a robust team. Actually, uh, Maria Cochamilio is her name. She's uh, the pharmacist at the hospital who's uh, focused on uh, antibiotic stewardship, which is the practice of ensuring we do the right things uh, to prevent resistance. And we're together. Uh, uh, with actually some support from uh, Wendy Dota at the uh, Sioux AMA and some students that have been supportive, uh, we're looking into how do we improve the practice of infection prevention and control and antibiotic stewardship across the North. So we're actively working on that and, and hoping that we can uh, have a strategy. Um, in terms of how to deal with the next pandemic uh, in general terms, I, I, you know, for the city of Sault Ste. Marie, uh, you know, that's not unfortunately within my sort of role at the hospital per se, but it doesn't mean that I'm not looking out for it. I mean, um, you know, uh, you know, shameless plug uh, to the, you know, I've worked with a group of friends and colleagues on something called Community Pass. Uh, we are really excited about it. It's just a, a little app tool uh, to be used by people personally and, and organizations where they can, you know, try and uh, screen patients and do contact tracing and keep your vaccine proof and test results. We, we wanted an all-in-one 
uh, solution, but we're, you know, it's more than that. We're, we're all obviously thinking about our community safety and we're thinking, how, how do we make sure that the health records and the, and the, and the infrastructure is set up so that we can manage these things in the future? Um, the, the province, uh, has had its, um, struggles uh, during the pandemic, as we're all well aware. And, you know, it's a lot harder for them to move the needle uh, or to push ahead with these types of technologies on a, on a large scale from a provincial level. And so we've been lucky that we've been able to do it uh, at a local level. And, and hopefully with time, we'll be able to do that a little more and a little more broadly. So I, I hope that answers that. I know it's, that's a big, complicated question. <laughs> well, it is a big, complicated question. I think you've given a, a, a concise and, and reasoned answer, uh, it, given the impossibility of, uh, of giving a long and complicated answer. Um, I'll bring one more question out of the Q&A, and this is from Nicolas Rouleau. And here's the question. Some of the most important discoveries throughout history have involved key observations that seemed small or insignificant at the time, but ended up being critical to forming new understanding. Have you or your colleagues noticed anything involving COVID patients that isn't being widely talked about in the public forum that you think deserves more attention? Hmm, that's a good question. Uh, I actually can't say that... Um... I can't say that there's something in particular that isn't getting enough attention. I think the one thing I would say involving COVID patients that still doesn't get enough attention, it's starting to, uh, is the fact that it's affecting marginalized populations more so than others. And it's not, you know, it's easy when we look at these types of infections to focus on uh, mortality rates and certainly um, the long-term care home population and the elderly population are the hardest hits. There's no question. And I, you know, I have nothing but, you know, um, you know, sadness about what's happened for that population. But there, there hadn't been at the start, uh, or maybe, maybe in my mind, not loud enough about the marginalized populations. How do we access them in terms of treatment? How do we ensure that they're uh, staying safe for themselves and for their families? How do we support them during this time? How do we get access to them in terms of doing testing or education or now it's vaccines? And we're starting to hear it a little bit more, but it's like you hear it for a little while and then it goes away again. And I think to me, that's the that's the, it, it seems like a, I, mean, I guess it doesn't really seem to me like a small piece, but maybe it seemed, it doesn't seem as significant because we're focused on mortality rates. And maybe because they're, you know, oftentimes these, some of these marginalized populations are younger, but they're, they're disproportionately being affected. Thanks yeah. very much. And I am actually going to um, uh, pass the baton, as it were, back to my colleague and uh, back to Dr. Morgan. And um, from my perspective, thank you very much. And over to you, Narocha. Excellent. We'll have uh, one more question before we wrap up uh, today's webinar. And if you have any other questions, again, feel free to email the research office or use the contact sheet and we can relay it to Dr. Castellani and hopefully get you the response. Um, so the last question that we have is also from Elvis, who asked, in terms of your medical education, why Australia? And how was the journey in terms of studying outside of Canada? Yeah, so uh, the truth uh, is I got in. Um, you know, I, I applied in Canada, I didn't get in. Um, I was, you know, I had an interview at a couple places, I, but I didn't get in and I got in Australia. And I also got in uh, in Ireland at the same time. And someone said to me, uh, you know, I was actually planning on going to Ireland and I was hesitating on Australia, I think because of the distance kind of scared me a bit. And um, and it was middle of winter and I walked in, I was, do, be, I was a physiotherapy assistant at the time. And one of the physios looked at me and they said, don't you want to wear flip-flops all the time? And I said, yes. Okay. And so Australia was, was kind of the, uh, was, was a bit of a weather decision, but, um, but I mean, from a medical education perspective, Australia is pretty similar to Ireland. And so there wasn't really a big uh, decision tree there. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was an amazing uh, experience. I would say, you know, I, I got to experience things that some of my colleagues that trained in Canada 
didn't have the opportunity to experience our, our university was uh, becoming a sort of global university, if you will, and they started developing partnerships all over the place. Um, they encouraged global electives. So I was able to do a rotation in uh, Trinidad and Tobago and spend time there. Um, a lot of my colleagues spent time in Southeast Asia and as well the Pacific Islands. Uh, and then when I came back to Canada, I was actually able to spend some time in New Orleans because our university had a relationship there. So learn a little bit from that population. Uh, and they also gave us a lot of freedom and liberty to do some experience uh, or get some experience and training in Canada before we applied for uh, for training. So I would say, although uh, it was a tough journey uh, in at some times, other times I actually really enjoyed it. And I think now my practice of medicine probably benefits from it. And I would argue all my colleagues that are now back here in Canada practicing with me, a few actually even here in Sault Ste. Marie alongside me, uh, they would argue the same thing. So yeah, it was, it was uh, a neat experience. And, um, you know, I look to those unexpected opportunities uh, when they come. That's awesome. Definitely a, a great opportunity to be able to travel and, and get a medical education at the same time. That's awesome. So um, I'd like everyone to, again, thank Dr. Lucas Castellani for giving his, his insights and an awesome talk uh, today to kick off uh, Research Week. And as I mentioned uh, before, if you have any other questions, comments, or concerns, uh, feel free to um, email the research office and we will help you out with your concern. Again, thank you again. We will uh, end today's webinar. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye.